What do you think of the video? Did you catch yourself in it? No. <laughs> well, that was all filmed last last week, second and third service. And it's kind of interesting. If you remember last weekend, we had the barbecue. And when they were putting the clips together, they told me, Dave, the um, clips that we have from being outside, they were too, too dark. Um, if you remember last weekend, it was a little bit cloudy. And said, so, well, that made sense. But when you stop to think about it, really, even with God's creation outside, how can that brilliance of a spring day compare with God's house filled with God's people? Amen? Yeah. So there was a lot going on. And so um, that video, uh, we'll, we'll re refer back to it during the message. Let's go ahead and open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just, um, we just thank you for so much, Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Father, we're so grateful for the fact that you provide all things to us, Father. 
and even our salvation secured by your sacrifice of your son's death on the cross. Father, we thank you for the ministry of Grace Point. And Father, those who call Grace Point home are so dedicated to allowing this ministry to happen. Father, we're grateful for the diligence and the, the uh, hard work, Father, the people put behind this ministry to allow your work to continue. Father, we thank you on Memorial Day weekend for so many people who have sacrificed and have given not only of their lives, Father, but of their time to uh, serve us as a nation. Father, we take time to uh, just pause for those people, Father, who have given so sacrificially. And Father, through all things, Father, we just ask that you be here with us this morning. Join us, Father, as we um, um, dig a little bit deeper into the Word. We just ask that you use the Word to, uh, to allow us to grow closer to you. And through all things, Father, we give you thanks and praise. We lift this up through your Son's holy name. Amen. As I mentioned, it's uh, Memorial Day weekend, and, um, and because of that, Jimmy has decided to uh, not hold the uh, Love and Respect class tomorrow night. So those who are attending that, don't show up tomorrow night, or you're going to be a class of one. So, <laughs> so remember that. But next Monday night, June 4th, he'll be back up and running. Women's ministry has taken a break for the summer, but it doesn't mean their activities are stopping. If you're reading the bulletin, there's going to be a woman's tea Saturday, June 23rd. All women are invited to that. If you have not signed up, please do so at the information booth, and they will uh, gladly uh, get your name added to the list. Jimmy's going to um, kick off in the fall of Foundations class. If you're a new Christian or if you need to get back to basics, it's going to be a 22-week class. I ask that you keep an eye out for the details in the bulletin. Sign up for that, and I think it'll be something that you'll be blessed in uh, serving. Um, also, we have needs. Uh, we have needs of volunteers in children's uh, ministry. Um, we're calling them heroes. We need helpers in children's ministry. Just want you guys to know that they're more afraid of you than you are of them. So please don't use that affair as a reason not to allow God to use you there. Also, we need help in the hospitality ministry, if you don't know what that is. That's helping Susan in the cafe. We do need help there desperately. So if you, want to, uh, if you have that outgoing personality, you love to talk to people, it's a great ministry to be involved with. Um, and also, next week, Tom will be back in the pulpit. He's going to be kicking off a new uh, series called Chasing the Wind. So be here for that, please. Um, turn with me to Luke chapter 15. We're going to um, start out um, with Luke. Um, the video, if you noticed, had no words. And I counted about 30 frames. You know the old expression, each picture is worth a thousand words. So I have about 35 minutes to share 30,000 words with you. So we have a lot of material to go through today. So bear with me as I fire through all the stuff that we have to cover. So the parable of the lost sheep, Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. So Jesus told him this story. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness to go to search for the one that's lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. And when he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, because I found the lost, my lost sheep. In the same way, note this, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous in heaven straight away. Interesting concept here. Have you ever felt separated from God? Or have you been one that God has in fact rescued and brought you into his fold? So think of the analogy 
of the palatable here um, is that a shepherd leaves 99 sheep in the flock to go search for the one. And even though the reason the shepherd leaves his flock, he understands that the value of that one lost sheep is worth risking the 99. But he realizes the 99 in the flock, in the fold, are protected by the numbers. So he's going to risk the 99 to search for the one. And the analogy we have here is that Luke goes on to tell us that it's the same thing with us, that the value of us as an individual, of the sacrifice that God made with his son's uh, crucifixion on the cross, is worth the risk to go out and search for that one lost soul. And that's kind of where we're at right now with Grace Point Fellowship. Think of us as individuals. What prevents us as an individual from reaching out to that one person that God brings into our life that we know needs Jesus Christ desperately? What prevents us from doing that? What prevents us from doing that as a fellowship, Grace Point Fellowship? What prevents us from reaching out for that one lost soul? Well, nothing's going to stop us but we do have a limitation. I don't know if you've ever noticed this sign at the front door. We're still under the occupancy permit for the previous tenant for this building. They sold furniture. They weren't designed for assembly. We're stuck at 299. We have plans that we've submitted to the city to allow us to go beyond 299 and it'd be close to 700 so it's 299 plus but the reality of the situation is the cost of what we need to do to get to that 700 is what are we going to have to do to get that next person legally in the door so we're in it for one I'm going to share with you and dissect a little passage that we're all familiar with most of the world's familiar with it. It's John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I want you to look at the order in which this is shared. God so loved, he gave. God so loved the world, that's you and I, that he gave his son, his only son, came down from heaven, come a mortal, to die and be crucified on the cross, to give us something that we could not obtain on, to our, on our own. He paid the price for our sins. The reality is only Jesus could do it. Only the spilt blood of Jesus Christ could fulfill and pay our sin in full to allow us to be restored to have eternity with our, our Creator, with our Father. He paid the price. But you're going to be sitting here going, Dave, you don't know the sins of my life. <laughs> well, you don't know the sins of my life either. But <laughs> the reality is, God does. And with that, He paid the price fully knowing the extent of our shortcomings. In Romans 5.8, he said, But God demonstrated his own love to us in that while we were still sinner, sinners, Christ died for us. He goes on in Romans 8.32 to say, And catch this, is he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for all of us, for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Think of that, is that we lack in the faith in the human condition of lack in the faith of having trust that God's going to provide for us, provide for our needs. That he has sacrificed his, soul, his own son, his own flesh and blood, so we could have eternity with him. Anything that we ask of him is peanuts in comparison. Think of it. Why do we worry about the provisions of this world? 
Well, the reason we do, if you're like me, is because we lack faith. And it's okay to acknowledge that, but understand what that does to us in that we need to overcome that lack of faith. Is it fear? But look at the promises that God has given us that if we do believe that we now be a child of the Most High God, that the promises continue, that we, have, we can now be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, that we have his favor, that we can now surround us like a shield, Think of the protection that God gives us. That's a promise. His sacrifice has now redeemed us from sin and disease. Have we experienced that in our lives? We can now have life more abundantly than we could ever imagine. Again, a promise that God has given us. That same power that raised Jesus from the dead can live in us. We just have to accept it. No weapon formed against us will now stand. We can be more than just conquerors. Then listen to this. We can place our boots on the neck of the defeated one. We literally got our foot on the neck of Satan. Without prejudice. Or I should say with prejudice. It's a legal term with prejudice. If your charges are brought up against you, and you're in a court of law in this country, and if the judge dismisses the case against you with prejudice, that means those charges will never, ever come up against you. And this is what Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, his death on the cross has done for us. Our sins are forgiven forever. These sins are dismissed from us, never to be used over us. This is what the death of the cross, Jesus' death on the cross has done for us. So, what does that mean in practical terms for us? This means the defeated one, Satan, Satan cannot have our families. Can't have our marriages. Bless you. Your health. Our finances. Our destiny. Our destiny has been paid for. Our jobs and careers have all been secured, are in God's hands. Anything that's yours, Satan cannot have. And why can't Satan have this? Well, these blessings don't come from Satan. They come from God. And that's the understanding that we have to have is that these things that we experience in our daily lives are not from Satan, but they're from God. God has already been victorious over Satan. So we should rejoice in that and understand that and don't act in fear. Tom shared last week that because of what God has done and that these, these blessings come from God, that we no long, longer use the possessive pronoun of mine. These are his. And we become mere stewards of what he's given us. Changing gears here a bit. Let's, let's drill down on the word stewardship. As leadership, we've done a pretty lousy job here at Grace Point Fellowship of communicating to you what we're doing here as a ministry. Tom shared a vision with you last week. Well, let, me, let me lay a foundation for you. Here we are in this building. Uh, we have a five-year lease on it, and we pay $8,000 a month rent, lease payment, for this building. To date, through your generous sacrificial giving, We've put almost eight, I mean $400,000 into this facility without asking, without asking you for additional help. I know we did a fun thing with the chairs and that type of stuff, but the most point, we trust the God to provide for us to allow ministry to take place in this building. Mind you, this building is just a tool of ministry. It allows ministry to take place. There's nothing special about the building. 
other than that God is asking us to use it. However, now, we're, we're at a dilemma. For us to use this building more fully, we have to put a lot more money into it. Inside your bulletin, I put together a quick cheat sheet of most of the projects that we need to do to make this building work for God's kingdom to its full capacity. You're seeing $800,000 of identifiable expenses here. But it's probably going to be closer to a million. So here's the challenge for us as leadership. We love our landlord, but do we love him enough to put a million dollars into his pocket? We're feeling led that for us to take this next step of faith, we need to have this building committed to God. We need to have it owned by God's people. And so that's why Tom made the appeal next last week of us not only to purchase this building, but the building across the street. So, why are we going for two buildings? Well, let's come back to what we have in this building. We're sitting here, and this service, we know it's a holiday weekend, so we're pretty light. We're usually a little bit more people in this service. It's like, why aren't we using the mezzanine? Well, there's a couple issues with the mezzanine. One, it was not designed for assembly. So for us, we need to re-engineer this so that we can have people sitting up there. Another thing, we need to make it accessible for those who are handicapped. So we need to put an elevator in there. But the reality of the situation, by putting that capacity in, we're not dealing with the issue of why does the city only allow 299 people in this building? Well, one of the issues is egress. We need to continue to upgrade the front door. We replaced one set of doors with panic hardware. We need to get rid of that overhead door and put another set of doors in. We need to punch out behind this wall an exit going out to the alley. So that's the first step. Second step is this building is an up to seismic code, the new standards, standards for seismic. So we need to, that's why you don't see prices on that. We're still working with an engineer on what it's going to take to bring this up to current sta uh, seismic uh, standards. And the other thing is the trusses. The trusses need to be reinforced. When we get those three things done, the city tells us, we then can then take that 299 and change it to 700. But the reality of the situation, it's that one additional person that we're doing all that expenses, doing all these under expenses for. Think of restrooms. How desperately do we need expanded restrooms? Major, yes. So that's something, obviously, we want to undertake. But here's the kill kicker on that. Because of a way the city, and this is true for most cities, Method's not unique, they have something called system development fees. And that usually means when you tie into the source system, that's when they go ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching on their fees. So every new toilet, every new sink we put in, it comes with a fee. So for us to have the privilege, as we have envisioned the restrooms to be, we're going to write a check for over $100,000 for the city for the privilege of expanding the restrooms. So again, we're looking at huge expenses. And here's what I'm confident in. If God, in less than two years, has provided through your generosity and your regular support, tithes, and offerings almost $400,000, why would we not expect him in the next three years to provide 800000 just through tithes and offerings to do this honey-do list? He's going to do it. But the problem is, do we want to continue to invest in a building that's not devoted to God, the kingdom? And that's the challenge that we have from I'm all in. And I ask on this one is that if, if you haven't received, if you weren't here last weekend, the deacons and greeters on the way out will hand you the pamphlet that we handed out last week that will include the pledge card. And what we're asking people is to look at what they can give above and beyond. I know personally, sitting down with you as individuals and working out budgets, that a lot of us are really living paycheck to paycheck. 
And so what we have asked is really beyond your reach. And we understand that. All we're simply asking is look at what God is giving you. He's not going to hold any of us responsible for things he hasn't given us. But even if you can sacri sacrificially give for that extra dollar above and beyond your tithes and offerings, God's going to bless it to allow us for that one other person that he wants here with us. So it's, it's been a tough journey. It's going to be a sacrificial journey. And we're asking a lot of you. I have to share the challenges that have happened to us here on staff. It's kind of funny. Um, well, as this program, as God was given us the vision and we were putting the pieces together, that we've been challenged here. It's just so funny, all, all the little things that can go wrong. And for us, that's confirmation. It's like <laughs> Satan doesn't want what we're about to embark on. And so we know we're confirmed. We're confident that God is asking us to pursue this. And here's a little side note for you. Is, is the building across the street is going to be future growth. We're going to be tied up here on what God has laid out on this side of the building for the foreseeable future. That's from our limited point of vision. We have no idea what God's view is. But here's an interesting fact from the point of stewardship. That building across the street is rented. And there's two, there's two businesses over there, if you don't realize. You have the furniture store, and behind the furniture store, there's a cell tower. If God is successful in allowing us to purchase both buildings, the reality of the situation is going to be the mortgage payment on both buildings is going to be a, around what we pay for rent for just this one building. So think about it. We can have use of this building without any impact on cash, that we can free up that $8,000 a month to continue to work on things that are going towards God's kingdom. So it's a big undertaking. We don't want to dismiss this as being something that's, that's easy. No, this is going to take sacrifice. I've been challenged as Tom kicked off this all-in campaign is that I like to compartmentalize my life and I kind of put things in tiers. Top tier was God, family, and ministry. And those kind of revolved in their own little bubble. Sometimes God was number one, sometimes Janet was number one, sometimes ministry be number one. But I was challenged when God, when God used Tom with all this all in ministry is how can I be all in when God's not always number one? So this is a challenge. It's like, okay, Dave, you can't be all, all in if I'm putting God's work ahead of God, if I'm putting my wife ahead of God. So I was challenged on this. Another thing I was challenged on is, is Tom challenged us as staff and leadership that we have to lead. If we're asking you to sacrificially give. Tom's asking us as staff, what are we doing? So Jenna and I, we're, we're feeling a little bit smug. And God has a way of humbling people who get smug. And he did with us. Is that we literally, for our emergency day fund, had $5,000 in there. And we figured, okay, we're going to commit that to the building fund. And literally, a week ago Friday, as I was preparing to put this message together, Jen and I are dealing with the news that in a HVAC unit, there's two connectors on the condenser that have failed. And you can't replace them. You have to replace the whole condenser. So that's a $2,000 bill. But then we're challenged, is it worth putting a condenser into a 15, 20-year-old unit? So we're looking at a $5,000 bill. Well, there goes that cash. So here's the challenge that Jenna and I had. Is that going to change what our commitment was to the all-in for the building? Jen and I prayed about it, and we both came up with the decision, no, we will find a way to make up that $5,000.
Last, two, last Wednesday it was, I was sitting in a meeting with Tom and Jimmy, and we were meeting with somebody here in the congregation, and my phone rang. And it was from a person that Jenna and I had lent money to about two years ago. And God has given us this opportunity over the years that if we have friends and family in need, and if we have the cash, we will help them out. And, and we all know that that's part of the worst thing you can do in a relationship is like lend somebody money. But when we would lend the money, is it was under these conditions. We're never, ever going to ask you for the money back. It's like, yes, if you're in a position to pay it back, great. But we're not going to ask you. And this particular individual over the last two years, every now and then made, made a payment, which was always appreciated. But the, basically the vast majority of this note still outstanding. Well, the news that he shared, I had to go to voicemail, is that he's going to pay it off this week. So you can look at that as a coincidence, but I'm looking at it as God honoring the fact that he provided for us. And the challenge for us, I think, as we look for our sacrificial giving, that God is going to replace these things. We use a line in the finance class, if you ever take the finance class, um, that I challenge people with. A lot, a lot of things that we struggle with in the area of personal finances is definitely an area of faith. And I, I have this one saying that I, I get from Crown Financial Ministries. It says, small things are small things, but faithfulness in a small thing is a big thing. And here I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to float this, this sentence out to you. And I know it's going gonna, it's gonna to sound shocking at first. We are worth only what we're willing to share with others. We're worth only what we're willing to share with others. Now, don't get me wrong on this. We know that we're priceless in God's eyes. God sacrificed his son because of us. So think about that. I want you to dwell on that, and, to, and I'll expand upon that later. But Luke explains it a little bit better. He says, here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. If you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large things. But if you are dishonest in the little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you are untrustworthy, untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? It comes down to faith. And we all struggle with faith. Um, there's an illustration of... of Zoologists, zookeepers. Some of you may know that I've, I'm affiliated with Wildlife Images up in Merlin. And our animal ambassadors, our resident animal ambassadors, um, each one obviously has special needs. When I'm up there on campus, occasionally I just like to get out of the office and I'll stroll around the campus. And we have two grizzly bears, they're brother and sister. The, the male is 1,200 pounds. And sometimes, as I said, I just like to go out and walk and visit with Cody. So I can stand up in front of Cody. He's literally six feet on the other side of this fence. And I'll sit there and look at how magnificent this creature is that God's created. The strength of 1,200 pounds. And I'll be sitting there realizing that this is the most isolated part of campus. I'll be sitting there staring into his beady eyes and just getting lost in how magnificent he is. Come the realization is this this chain link fence between me and him. A couple electrified wires. Just thinking about this beautiful animal. And I recall the story of staff that Les Schwab had these big 
construction tires from an excavator, six feet tall. And so they put a tire each in with each grizzly bear called animal, um, yeah, give them some animal entertainment, something different in their enclosure. And with Cody, the next day they came in, the tires turned inside out. You imagine the strength? I'm standing there staring at Cody going, wait a minute, I'm getting out of here. I'm so far away from anybody that even if there was, a, if Cody decided to break through this fence, I'm in trouble. But the reality is I quickly lost faith in what man constructed with this fence. There's another illustration that's used is with zookeepers with African impalas. These little animals can jump 30 feet, 10 feet high. How do the zoologists, zookeepers, keep these animals contained? They just have to build a three-foot solid wall. Why does that contain an impala? They can't see where they land. So they won't take the leap without having the guarantee of knowing where they land. And that kind of impacts us as Christians. A lot of times, we won't take that leap of faith because we don't have a guarantee of where we're going to land. So, where does this leave us? Again, God challenges us. But when does faith cross over to foolishness? We all know what this is. Dollar bill. Just a one dollar bill. It's on paper. Is it any more valuable than this? Well, what determines the value? Okay, guys, who has a Rolex? I got a dollar. Trade? Come on, Jurgen. <laughs> you don't have one. What are you wearing, though? <laughs> okay, I'll take it for a dollar. Oh, well, here, I get, now I have a value for the dollar, okay? I was going to go to the next one and so say, hey, I'll give you a dollar for a pencil. Okay? <laughs> now you can keep it. But the point is, there's no value to this until I put it to use. And that's for us. It's like, we have no value. We have no worth until we're put to use. So for us as individuals, when are we going to step out in faith? Isaiah 55.3 says, What you hold in your hand cannot multiply until you put it into the hands of God. But if you let go and let God, he will use it beyond your wildest imagination. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. So, we're worth only what we're willing to share with others. We're going to be handicapped by fear. We're not going to step out on faith. Until we challenge ourselves to understand what's holding us back. For those of us who are struggling, as I said earlier, with a very tight financial budget, one of the things that God promises that he will always match our needs. Do we really trust who God says he is? That our needs are going to be met. I use this illustration in my finance class and I use coffee. Sorry guys for those of us out here are baristas. I don't mean to be picking on the coffee stands. But for reality, we have a need and it's coffee. We need that caffeine fix in the morning. But God also gives us wants that go beyond our basic needs. And every now and then, we get indulgences. There's nothing wrong with any of these. Needs, wants, and indulgences. They're all blessings from God. But here's, here's a trick that we use in spent for the spending plan a.k.a. also known as budgets. I don't like using the word budget. So in a spending plan, 
we can uh, have our fix with the morning coffee. We can choke down a cup of Folgers in the morning, brew up, brew up the 10 cup in the Mr. $29 Mr. Coffee that we got at Walmart, and, and say, okay, I got my caffeine, but I'm not enjoying this experience. I'm going to hit Costco and pick up the 200 espresso machine and get the good coffee beans, and I'm going to make this stuff at home. So with that, we, um, we can have a need that goes beyond, a, um, or a want beyond the basic need. Or the indulgence is when we head off to good old local coffee shop. For us from Boston, uh, the big coffee chain is Dunkin' Donuts. We don't have them here, and trust me, the Dunkin' Donuts you buy in the supermarket, it's not the same. So Jen and I, back at the beginning of May, we were back down in Southern California. Dunkin' Donuts are making their way here to Oregon. And we just wanted to find out, God, do you want us to go in? And we were just looking for a sign. You know, tell us, God, are we going to have this donut and coffee or not? For those who can't read it, it says, do not enter. We're at the exit of the drive through Trust me, we went in anyways. I like my coffee black, but Dunkin' Donuts does a cold brew, and I get it iced, and it has to be with cream and sugar. So not only do I not need it, but I don't need it where it packs it on the waist. But the demonstration I have here, and this is where I apologize for those who make a living selling coffee, is it's an easy way that we can perhaps save some money in our budget. If God's leading you to... Um, to, to give to the campaign to buy this building. But you're looking f at your budget, and it's like, where do I get the extra money? Well, this is one suggestion. We can brew the Folgers at home probably for 15, 20 cents a cup, but we've been spoiled by all the chains in that we like good coffee. But here, if we brew up a 16 ounce, if we make our own cappuccino or espresso, for about 70 cents, times five days is $3.50 $3 a week, $17.50 a month, or $182 a year. But most of us, because of time or whatever, we're going to rush out. We're going to hit the coffee shop. We're going to get the 16 ounce, spend the three bucks. I'm not throwing the tip in there because we all t tip the baristas, right? Okay, I want to make sure. Yes, we tip them well. Times five days, if 15 bucks a week, $65 a month, or $780 a year. The difference between those two figures is $600 approximately. And that's what we're asking, that sacrificial above and beyond of $50 a month. Now, for me, I don't, I don't drink coffee out that often, maybe once a week. But for my wife and I, if you go home, you open up a refrigerator, it's like a cave. I think we got like a cotton of milk and a bottle of ketchup that really isn't red anymore. Yeah, it is gross. <laughs> we eat out. So for us, the sacrifice is going to be we're going to eat out less, cook at home more. But here's another trick. Is in our finance class, I always ask people to look for the holes in their spending plan. And where most of us have the holes is what we spend out of our pocket without even thinking. We go into the 7-Eleven. We, we hit the grocery store, pick up something that's not on the list. Hit the local coffee shop. Eat out. Hit McDonald's. Whatever it is. What I ask is if you can do this for a month, just write down everything that you spend. Just write it down. Can't do it for a month. Do it for two weeks. Do it for a week. I just want you to become aware of where you're spending. And if God is leading you to contribute to the all-in, look at the areas where you can save. These things you get three for a dollar at the dollar store. Don't go to Central Point. My wife cleaned them out yesterday. But we have a pile of them here at the information booth on the way out. If you want one, grab one. Um, and it's just an easy way for you to say, okay, God, I'm feeling led, but I don't know where the money's coming from. Well, look at maybe perhaps how you can save a little bit in your budget. And for Jenna and I, we're not going to be eating out as much. And I'm going to tell you a few restaurants in town are going to be hurting. 
So, <laughs> so again, we're just gatekeepers of what God provides. Um, and here's the challenge for us as gatekeepers. As we're stewards, here's the challenge. We can have faith, or we can have control, but we can't have both. We read in, in Matthew 25, Paul tells us the parable about the rich man about in part on a journey. And he says, For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. I challenge you again. We are worth only what we're willing to share with others. We all know the parable. The one who got ten immediately went out and found a way to invest it. Same with the second one. But the first one did not want to take the risk. He buried it. Again, what's the value? What's the val value of a talent that's not shared? What's the value of a dollar that's not used? That's the challenge for us as Christians, is our faith. And it's okay if we struggle with it. An author put it this way, we need to step into the conflict without knowing if we can resolve it. We need to share our faith without knowing how our friends are going to react to it. We need to pray for a miracle without knowing how God will answer. We need to put ourselves into a situation that activates a spiritual gift that, we can nev that we've never exercised before. And we need to go after a dream that is destined to fail without divine intervention. Folks, we're the hands and feet of God. We're not going to be blessed sitting here. We're going to be blessed when we're doing and acting upon what God has given us. I've heard this prayer worded many different ways, but simply it comes down to this. Lord, break my heart for the things that break your heart. The simple thing on this is that we're all gifted differently, and we're all going to see things differently because God uses our experiences. He uses our gifts to see things differently that others may miss. So for us, it's what God breaks your heart for is an area where God wants you to serve. We're not going to be responsible for everything. But that's where you take your talents and your skills that God has given you and apply them for the kingdom. Mark Batterson says, We want joy without sacrifice. Think of the joy that we can experience on a Sunday at a worship time when there's 600 people sitting in this room. We want character without suffering. We basically have become a society that's adverse to pain. We don't want consequences for any of our actions. We want gain without pain. Well, athletes know this. They know they, they seek the burn. They're not getting the burn. They know they're not gaining. We want a testimony without a test. Well, folks, I got news for you. We're all living our testimony. We're living the test right now, and what we leave this earth is going to be the legacy, will be the testimony of us in our lives. We want success without failure. Well, I don't know about you, but I can't think of one failure that I experienced that I did not take away something. Growing up, um, I grew up in the Boston area, surprise, um, is that we would go through the recessions when we used to have recessions, you almost put, set your clock to it every three or four years, country would go into recession. New England would go into like a great recession. We had all that old rust belt industries, and every time it was a recession, you'd have company after company closing. But Boston was blessed by the fact we had so many universities that you had these minds that were always challenged. And when they were let go, when these companies closed, they went out and did new things from these failed organizations. 
So each time we went into a recession, it was less and less. The economy diversified. The failures were turned into successes. In Boston right now, the Boston area is like the Bay Area of San Francisco. It's just you can't afford to live there because every, the economy is booming so much. But again, the takeaway, there is no failure in failure unless we close our eyes to the lessons that are being learned. Also, we want it all without going all out for it. Well, I got news for you folks. God can, can do this regardless of us. Even if we're not committed. But the thing if we're not committed, we're not going to get the, the blessings. So that's why we're in it for one. Everything that we need to do here, that God's calling us to do, is for one person to change it from 299 on your insert you're going to see there's a spot I'm in it for it's a blank I want you to think of that one individual that you've been in contact with years and you have been praying I would love them to see them here some Sunday with me. Is it a spouse, family member, friend, a co-worker? Who do you want here Sunday sitting with you during church? Who do you want to experience the joy that we have here at Grace Point Fellowship? Their experience in life, just like the rest of us, as we saw in the beginning of the video, it happens to all of us. Life happens. But what's the difference? Here at Grace Point, we can share it with each other. We understand that this is only temporary, that God has a purpose for life to happen. And, but for us, it's the expense. Think of the effort. Think of NASA when they launch a rocket. We've all seen the videos of this. Is the rocket sitting on the launch pad? And we see lots of activity, see the clouds of dust and smoke long before we see movement in the rocket before it moves that one foot off Earth. Think of how much it takes to turn an aircraft carrier a few degrees. How much power it takes to get an airplane off the ground. Think of the effort it takes to get that first automobile off an assembly line the engineering, the designing, getting the resources together, the subcontractors, acquiring the facility, building the facility, training the workers. Think of it, somebody who's graduating high school, 12 years of going through school, all the resources that were paid, poured into that individual to get him out of a secondary education. Think of this, the expense that God paid for that first person saved. Who was that one person? We know that God sent his son to the cross for all of us, but there was that first one person. Who was it? Jimmy's gonna lead us with the worship team here, the words of this song, Reckless Love. Look at the words, listen to the words, and you'll understand what we're talking about. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. And you've been so, so good. took a breath, you breathed your life in me, and you have been so, so kind to me, oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, oh, it chases me down, fights to I couldn't burn it, I 
don't deserve it Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God Yeah Your foe, still your love fought for me. And you have been so, so good to me. And when I felt no worth, you paid it off for me. And you have been so, so kind. To me, all oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. All oh, the chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the night in night. And I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Folks, as you pray on how God's going to lead you in this next step, next chapter of Grace Point Fellowship, just remember this. There's no gift too big, too small. We all understand it's sacrificial. Your giving is between you and God. Our policy here is nothing is shared with the staff. Your gift is truly between you and God. But when you're praying on asking how God's going to use you, is just think of what God has done for you and why we need to share this with others. If you guys have any questions, please seek me out. Have any questions whatsoever, let me help you work through it. We're going to be down here for prayer and during this final bridge and choruses, stand up, sing out to God what he's done for you. Thank you. There's no shadow you won't light up, no mountain you won't climb up, you're coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, no lie you won't tell it, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, no mountain you won't climb up, you're coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down. Me. There's no shadow you won't light up, no mountain you won't climb up, you're coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, the lie you won't tear down, you're coming after me. Don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Yeah, yeah. 
God bless you guys. We'll see you back here next week, okay?